Good morning on this glorious day of Advent, and welcome to First Christian Church Sunday service. We begin with our call to worship. This Advent, we hope and pray for joy as we journey together, for sight for the blind and healing for the sick, freedom for the prisoners and good news for the poor, release for the oppressed with justice for all, and love for each other. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord has come. Today for our prayer of invocation, I'd like to present a special invocation followed by the Lord's Prayer. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky let down where he lay, the little Lord Jesus asleep in the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky, and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay, close by me forever, and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and take us to heaven to live with thee there. Forgive us, O Lord, if we let this season go by without caring or sorrow for all who have died. Let us remember that we are still here to help and aid the needy far and near. Help us remember the reason you came to spread love and hope in your precious name. Grant us your blessing to give and to care for all of your people everywhere. Far away in a manger in this special stall, you gave us your Son to give life for all. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the third Sunday of Advent, we light the pink candle, which celebrates the joy of anticipation of the Lord's coming. Christ is coming. We gain confidence from that assurance. And look, Our hope grows even stronger, for three lights are burning where there was darkness. 
Let us pray. Dear God, in the height of our Advent walk, grant us the courage to experience joy. Joy in the face of apathy. Joy in the face of sorrow. Joy in the face of uncertainty. Amen. first reading today is from Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 4 and verses 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall bind up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This ends the first reading.
This morning we are hearing from the Apostle Paul in his epistle, Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16 and concluding with verse 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Thus ends our hearing of this word for us this morning. In this Advent season, as we await the coming of Christ, let us begin with prayer. Light of the world, come. Come to the oppressed and exploited. Come to the despised and rejected. Come to all in whom the divine image is distorted. We wait in joyful expectation. Come not as a man of power, but in love and compassion. Come to the outcast, like the shepherds in the fields. Come to foreigners, like magi watching from afar. Come to rich and poor, young and old, male and female. We wait in hopeful anticipation. Come to bless all creation with your love. Come to bring salvation on the earth. Come to rule with justice and in peace. Come, light of the world, illuminate our path. We wait with all peoples of the earth, light of the world. We welcome your coming as we struggle this morning with justice and joy. Amen. It had been a long time since his mother had seen her childhood home. She and her family had been taken away to live in a strange land where they did not know the language nor understand the culture. Such were the fortunes of war. Her son, the second generation, did not grieve what he had never known, but his heart broke whenever he saw his mother weep as she remembered another time, another place called home. Her grandchildren had accommodated to this new land in ways that truly alarmed her. They were forgetting their heritage, their cultural story, their faith, the way of life that made them a distinct community. She began her journey as an immigrant, a foreigner, and now her grandchildren seem foreign to her. She often wept as home eluded her. This could be the story of an exiled Israelite who hungered to return to the promised land. It also could be the story of a displaced refugee from Syria or my husband's Danish grand, great grandparents or a Native American survivor of the Trail of Tears. Amazingly, scripture often tells the timeless human story of hunger for justice alongside the promise of joyous restoration. The names and location change and certainly the historical time frame, but the displacement of people as a result of the injustices of famine pandemics, or war, as well as a claiming of future hope, is a repeated story on our globe. The Israelites were taken from their homes as captives and lived for 70 long years in Babylon before the great king of Persia, Cyrus, liberated them to return 
back to Jerusalem. They went back home, but it was not how they expected it to be. Is it ever? Solomon's great temple lay in ruins. The city was a remnant of what it once was. Rebuilding was going to be hard, and life was certainly not to be comfortable. The ones left behind had made their own way as best they could, and now the Babylonian exiles returned to reclaim a lost heritage. The foraging of true community was going to be difficult. Where was justice? Where was joy? Can you have one without the other? It is to this reality that the author of our text this morning, as found in Isaiah, is writing. Scholars often refer to this segment as Third Isaiah, that part of the book that was written after the exiled returned to the Jewish homeland. 560 years later, Jesus, returning to his hometown of Nazareth, read this text from the scroll in the synagogue, concluding with, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he sat down, saying to the congregation, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, says the gospel writer of Luke. What does it mean to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? It is known as the year of Jubilee, which occurs at the end of seven cycles of Shmata, or sabbatical years, which equates to every 50 years, when all debts were to be forgiven, all slaves freed, and property was returned to their original owners. You can locate this Jewish celebration in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. It was historically more than an ideal than practice, but a jubilee year was a year meant for restoration, for parity, when obstructions to an abundant life would be removed and all would start again from a level playing field. Justice would be restored and joy would return for God loves justice, says Isaiah. By reading Isaiah 61, Jesus claims the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord. Therefore, the world longingly anticipates the birth of the babe born in a manger. We hunger for the year of Jubilee, for liberation, restoration, and a just reality where children do not go to bed hungry or without shelter, where sickness does not injure or war displace families, where truth is something that unites rather than divides us. Amy Grant, songwriter, singer, and Christian, wrote and performs a song entitled Grown Up Christmas List. You can access her video on YouTube, and I highly recommend that you bless yourself by doing so. You can uh, see there that uh, the refrain says, so here's my lifelong wish, my grown up Christmas list, not for myself, but for a world in need. No more lives torn apart than wars would never start, and time would heal all hearts, and everyone would have a friend, and right would always win, and love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. It is a list, I think, she shares with Christ, who is still working 
to bring compassion to the world through people like Amy, like you, like me, and countless others. But sometimes, especially during these times, I wonder as I survey the grief, the injustices, the anger and hatred poisoning the globe, can there be real joy without justice? Can we be content in our privilege when so many are left out in the cold? Of course, this is not a new question nor a new problem. The congregation to whom the Apostle Paul is writing around 20 years following that first Easter was not a just nor easy reality in which to live. Thessalonica is the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia, Macedonia, and Paul got to spend a brief time there with the Christians, but developed a strong bond with these beloved brothers and sisters. The Gospels have yet to be written, making Thessalonians our oldest piece of Christian literature. Regardless of their circumstance, however bleak or difficult, Paul makes rejoicing a signature of faith. It is likely this early in Christian history that there was a strong hope that Christ's second coming was imminent, after which there would be a reversal of fortunes. The year of Jubilee would come with Christ. As time went on, faith was defined by the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Faith as assurance of that which we hope for and the convictions of what yet has to be seen can bring us to a place of rejoicing even in the not yet dreams of our grown-up Christmas lists. That is, we dare to dream with God and rejoice in the invitation to partner with the lover of justice. And thereby, we find reasons to lift up joy and justice and hope and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us as we prepare for that time of fellowship of remembrance as we gather around the Lord's table. We are here in the Graves living room in front of our fireplace mantle, which has our nativity for the celebration of Advent. We hope these ascetics will add to your spiritual food as you prepare by bringing a crust of bread and some liquid refreshments and participating virtually with this wonderful service, this wonderful gathering at Christ's invitation. Let us prepare. There's a song by the Bill Gaither Trio that I would like to use for this morning's prayer for the bread. 
shackled by a heavy burden neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Since I've met, I met this blessed Savior, since he's cleansed me and made me whole, oh, I will never cease to praise him. I will shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. We ask that you bow your heads in prayer for the cup. Dearest Lord, please touch us, make us whole, prick our hearts that we may shine that everlasting light that draws people, people closer to you. And let us recognize that which is in us that draws people closer to you and use it to its utmost. And in that, we will exhibit the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For I pass on to you that which was taught to me, that on that night in the upper room when Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples, he took the bread, blessed it, and then broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And afterwards, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. As often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. God's gifts for God's people. My friends, Emmanuel, God is with us, comes into our brokenness to share our vulnerability. Emmanuel, God with us, comes into our captivity to offer us release. Emmanuel, God with us, comes into our fear, reclaiming us for love. Emmanuel, God with us, comes into our poverty to fashion us for justice. Emmanuel, God with us, comes into our war-torn hearts to heal with peace. Go forth with God, announcing the good news of Christ's coming. Bring the light of Christ this Advent to all your family, friends, and neighbors. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. Yeah.